these were these were commitments that myself and Governor Whitmer made during the course of the campaign. We we campaigned on shutting down Line 5 and we were elected, which tells me that that is what the electorate wanted. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what else you believe in. If you are a Michigander, you love the Great Lakes. And without it, I don't know what we are. And it's not just, of course, the fact that we love to use them for a variety of different reasons, but of course, our economy is based on sustaining the purity of the Great Lakes. You know, so much of it obviously falls to us to ensure uh, that the sanctity of the Great Lakes are properly protected. And that's why I think when you look at even funding uh, for various federal resources, it's sometimes it's the only time when the Republicans and Democrats can come together and say, we need to work cooperatively in order to protect the sanctity of the Great Lakes, our drinking water, uh, recreation. Life itself. Yeah, life itself. The real focus of this is the location of the pipeline. I mean, there are many issues, bigger picture issues about continuing reliance on fossil fuels and so forth. But the real focus of the litigation that the Attorney General brought in 2019 and the litigation um, that she brought on behalf of the governor and the DNR in November is on the fact that this pipeline does not belong where it is. In some seasons, it so falls out that the currents run three days eastward, two days to the west, one to the south, and four northward, sometimes more and sometimes less. The cause of this diversity of currents could never be fathomed. For in a calm, they'll run in the space of one day to all points of the compass, um, sometimes one way, sometimes another, without any limitation of time, so that the decision of this matter must be left to the disciples of Copernicus. I assume you're familiar with the term of public trust, and that under that that principle that there are certain resources, the Great Lakes and the bottomlands beneath them, are resources that the public as a whole have the right to preserve and protect. And the state acts as a trustee for the public use and stewardship of those resources. Given what we now know about the condition of the pipeline, where it's situated, the various risks it's subject to, it's not consistent with the state's duty to protect the public trust to allow its bottom lands to continue to be used for this purpose at that location. So that's the core argument. Again, the key focus of both the AG's lawsuit and the lawsuit we filed on behalf of the governor is the critical stretch of the straits where um, the state has an unmistakable duty and the clear legal right to control the use of the bottom lands. That's the focus. That's where I think the state's authority is the greatest, the risks are most apparent, and the risks you know, justify that action. Enbridge has imposed on the people of Michigan an unacceptable risk of a catastrophic oil spill in the Great Lakes that could devastate our economy and way of life. That's why we're taking action now and why I will continue to hold accountable anyone who threatens our Great Lakes and freshwater. What happens on May 12th with the shutdown of Line 5? Does Governor Whitmer go in and turn it off herself manually or? I think in all likelihood, the uh, oil will not stop flowing. And here's where it gets, you know, a little complicated. It, it's quite interesting. Enbridge is saying we won't shut down absent a court order. And by virtue of their litigation, they've made it impossible for there to be a court order. How do they do um, that? So uh, what, when the governor 
issued her order on November 12th. Uh, the attorney general at the same time filed an action in state court to uh, basically to get a declaration as to the validity of the governor's order. Now, strictly speaking, that's not necessary, not legally necessary. The governor's order should have independent force. But what Enbridge did, instead of litigating out the merits of the governor's order uh, in state court, it said, no, 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 this case doesn't belong in state court. We're gonna remove it to federal court. And while that jurisdictional issue is being hashed out, no court really has jurisdiction to issue any kind of order to shut down the pipeline. On May 12th, what, what, what happens then? Aren't they in violation? Aren't they operating illegally? I think as of, yeah, as of the date, uh, the effective date of the governor's order, Enbridge will be in intentional trespass on state-owned lands, and they will be transmitting that oil uh, in trespass. It's much like what Enbridge is doing at the Bad River Reservation. I think there will be now two locations along the pipeline where Enbridge is acting in intentional trespass. Enbridge made a deal with the state of Michigan in 1953 to not let certain things happen. And then they let them happen. And I believe that at some point, one has to look at the state's rights. And whether you're on the liberal or conservative end of the spectrum, you would think that that easement agreement should be honored. It's first, it was very clear about what was supposed to happen and it's been clearly violated. Enbridge has been replete in coming up with disinformation, okay? And the biggest disinformation play that they've been making is that if this line gets shut down, there will be a substantial increase in energy costs in Ontario, in Michigan, uh, uh, interruption in supply for jet fuel at Detroit Metro Airport. None of this is substantiated. None of it is substantial. Uh, the most recent uh, support failure, that there was an injunction to shut down the line for the one segment of the line for almost 80 days or yeah, something like yeah. that, okay? And, and during that period of time, the price of gasoline in Michigan, in Ontario, across the upper Great Lakes, did not change one cent, okay? This tunnel idea, I don't think it's possible, personally. I've seen the tunnel discussion as a very, very big and effective distraction. Well, Bart, let me let me follow up with that then and just say this. You know, I've always seen it as a distraction and a way to prolong the use of uh, the current Line 5 because people, I think, had come around to the point where they saw the incredible danger of Line 5 and so this was a way to convince people to extend its usage, understanding that each and every day that Line 5 remains operational is a day that Enbridge is pocketing millions and millions of dollars, and they want to extend it as long as they possibly can. And irrespective of how long it takes, or if even at all, uh, the tunnel is built, it's not making 
Line 5 in its current iteration any less dangerous each and every day that it's operating. So we have to focus on decommissioning Line 5 in any way that we can uh, so that we don't have this um, catastrophic spill that we're all concerned about and which is why we're engaged in this discussion in the first place. The discussion uh, about the, the likelihood of a tunnel even materializing, the most important parts to realize is that the governor's agreement, Governor Snyder's agreement with Enbridge has some really significant factors that are embedded in it. One of which is that he's allowed Enbridge to continue sending commodities through the submerged section of that line until the tunnel is built. The second one is that Enbridge is not obligated to build the tunnel. They can walk away from this at any point in time when they find that the economics are not viable for that tunnel to be constructed. It, the question of whether or not the tunnel is, is a serious project or a ruse, uh, I'll believe it when it, the Enbridge annual report starts showing a budget for it. And originally that uh, planning estimate for the tunnel itself was, I don't remember the diameter of it. That was The original diameter was 10 feet. 10 feet. And, and, and that was done, an estimate was done by a bunch of students at Michigan Tech. At Michigan Tech. And it was $500 million cost. Enbridge is still, a year and a half or two years after that, talking about a $500 million build. And now the tunnel is what, 21 foot? 21 foot, because they found out that nobody makes a 10 foot diameter tunnel boring machine, which is something I was saying right from the beginning. Enbridge hasn't got, moved off of their $500 million estimate. I mean, in engineering parlance, you can't double a project size or, or probably quadruple it. Quadruple the amount of dirt that okay. needs to be moved. Okay. Wait. Without increasing the cost. It's, it's going to be at, at a bare minimum a billion, if not two billion dollars for a four mile segment of a pipeline. If they're making five to six hundred, seven hundred million dollars of profit on that line per annum, Enbridge will never pay two billion dollars to build that pipeline. Basically, this is a shell game. Th this tunnel is never going to be realized. It's going to run into regulatory problems, and Ed's now starting to look at what the effect of that drilling will be through uh, broken limestone. It certainly isn't drilled through bedrock, as a lot of people would like to think. Some of it may be in bedrock, but at both ends of the tunnel, it goes down through all the strata that are there. Even at 100 feet down, they're gonna to have to have reinforced concrete through it, and they could very easily uh, contaminate the groundwater aquifer for northern Michigan. If there isn't serious consideration given to what dr drilling this huge hole uh, through an aquifer that supplies water to a whole lot of people, uh, if, if that question isn't carefully considered, this is exactly how you have the kind of wreck that, uh, of groundwater supplies that have become commonplace in the oil and gas industry. The exchange between the groundwater, the aquifer, and the open lake in uh, this area geologically from pretty much Grayling North to St. Ignace, or no, to Sault Ste. Marie, across this northern realm, is that you can get contaminated groundwater that's going to leach into the open water of the lakes, okay? And 20% of the time it's, uh, it's shipping uh, uh, natural gas liquids. 20% of the time it's not crude oil. And literally, the the explosive risk of the rest of the line is to, has to be factored in and putting NGLs, natural gas liquids, through a tunnel under the Straits of Mackinac is a pipe dream. I mean, literally, if you want uh, an area where an explosion could be catastrophic on both ends is whether or not you got, you got electrical supplies for, and for ventilation and for pumping in that tunnel and you got NGLs going through it that if there's a leak, you could end up having a pipe bomb of great size, four miles in length.
you know, this, this whole thing from an engineering viewpoint is something that I've fundamentally grown bored with, okay? You can only say so many things, you can only warn people so many times before you step back and say, well, you know, I've done my job, you've been warned. And, and now this thing is all balled up in the legal process, but the physical reality on the ground is unchanged. And uh, it, it's certainly something that is frustrating beyond belief that this looks like it's gonna be tied up in litigation for years and years and years with never ever worrying about the reality of what will happen if the thing ruptures. Can we dismiss the tunnel? We need to dismiss the tunnel. I mean, literally, if, if Enbridge believes the tunnel is the solution, shut down line five today and build a damn tunnel. We'll see where their money is, okay? Put their money where their mouth is. We started on this thing nearly seven years ago with just a few people and two technical people, you and me, that were raising concern about the thing. And it's really been an amazing journey to the point now that we have the governor and the attorney general of the state of Michigan that are concerned about Line 5. And we are at the point that her lawsuit, a drop dead date, has come and Enbridge is fighting it in federal court. and. Uh, so what's going to happen today? Well, nothing, but it a, marks a big chapter in the battle. If we reach the point where they're actually decommissioning the pipeline, it has been documented over and over again that there are far more jobs in decommissioning the pipeline than there are in keeping the pipeline operational. Or about the, spec the speculative tunnel that, that doesn't exist. If the tunnel is so a handful don't exist of extremely specialized jobs. Embridge has been doing projects across the region and they have to shown time and time again that they promise, promise, promise local jobs. Yeah. And then it ends up being the case that they hire out of state, out of country workforce. And it, the promises just all fall flat. Short term jobs and it's far and few between, very specialized. Okay. And this is if the tunnel actually happens. They still have a year, maybe two, before permitting is sorted out. Then there are legal challenges. Then there are likely more protests. And then they have three to seven years to actually build it. If nothing goes wrong, 10 years out, possibly a tunnel. So. And that's why we have to shut down. Line shut it five. down now. Citizens of the state are backing the governor and they want this pipeline gone. It is too much of a risk to our economy and our way of life. And so we have hundreds of people coming today to make that voice heard. Okay. And for the last week, Enbridge has had counter events and counter activities happening. They've had, like, but if nothing is going to, there's, they don't have the people on their side. Yeah, they're, they're hosting labor protests. They're, they're uh, capturing the Michigan legislature, the GOP. And this right here is, this is the people talking.
friends here. We're spotlighting who we are today. We have a lot of history of people being taken. And we all know about what's going on in Canada. We all know what's been going on with these man camps. And we're here to tell you it's got to stop. No more sisters stolen. And then those who are around the pipeline think that we're free for the taking. How many of you know somebody who's missing or murdered right now? So what we're here to say is that it's enough. You've taken our people for too long. You've taken our women for too long. But they know that we're the heart and the soul of our nation. We help all victims of crime, domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking. It's all related. We're not taking it anymore. No man camps here. I'm a survivor and I know many of you are. This is not happening anymore. Too many of our women are missing and murdered. And our families are hurt. Take a stand, I see all you warriors out there. All of you, male, female, two-spirit, everybody. Please, give a big old fist of one, hundred, and say, out! that we just posted on Enbridge's door here. Yeah. Notice of eviction, Enbridge Line 5 Pipeline, Straits and Mackinac. Pursuant to the notice of revocation and termination of easement of November 13, 2020, by the Governor of Michigan and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, concerned citizens of Michigan direct Enbridge, a foreign oil company, to immediately abandon operating Line 5 Pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac. The easement is being revoked for violation of the public trust doctrine and is being terminated based on Enbridge's long-standing, persistent, and incurable violations of the easement's conditions and standard of due care and violations of the public trust doctrine. On behalf of concerned citizens of Michigan, oil and water don't mix. So, we gather here today because 181 days ago, Governor Whitmer told Enbridge they had 180 days to shut down their pipeline. If any of us tried to profit over a million dollars a day by breaking the law, we'd be behind bars. Yet here they are still operating. So we're here to tell them enough is enough.
We are dealing with one of the most powerful hegemonic powers on the planet, mm -hmm. the oil and gas industry in Enbridge specifically. Enbridge made it known publicly that they were going to defy um, uh, Governor Whitmer's order, yeah. shutdown order on the 12th. So this is not a, a surprise to anybody. First of all, it, it's just an indication of how courageous our governor is. You know, this is a pipeline uh, that transports Canadian tar sands and goes back to Canada. I mean, it's it's all about Canada. Bart, we've, we've been at this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just thinking about this whole journey that we've been on. and. It's it's just common sense. You know, you can't have a 68-year-old oil pipeline in the, one of the most dangerous locations in the Great Lakes that could threaten our entire way of life. getting drone footage on this beautiful day. This is July 2021. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know why the heavy equipment is even out in the water like that. But judging by the location, we guess this is probably some buried power cable and it's not line five related. Because those buried cables can carry chemicals in them for coolant and such. And we talk about booms for catching and containing a spill on the water's surface. 
And here we have booms, the orange things, and they, you see they have the curtains that hang down. You can still see water splashing up over them. So even on a relatively calm day, you've got activity, the water is moving. Now maybe the booms are for the equipment. I don't know if that machine can go in the water or how it ended up in there, but the whole thing just seemed very strange. And this is an unusual site and it seemed very, very disorganized. And you see people nearby. So we're very close to homes and beaches. When we looked at this, it just made us think about preparations for a spill. Now the Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers have agreed that if Line 5 were to spill, um, say if Line 5 were to spill the whole million gallons, we're certainly not prepared for anything of that scale. Even a small area like this, I mean, whatever this is, whatever's going on here. And of course it's possible that the leak is coming from the machine itself. You know, this is just a little area on a mild day and the straits are four and a half miles wide. We've been sitting with Line 5 operating illegally for six months. For six months, well, the decision was made about a year ago, and then, yes, they were supposed to have complied six months ago, so yes. Enbridge said, we won't shut down unless there's a court order to do so. Uh, the governor and the attorney general saying you're operating against the law wasn't enough for Enbridge, so we're in legal, legal limbo. Yeah. And Enbridge is operating um, illegally. And one important thing, too, that the governor and the attorney general have said in the time, and during this time, that every day that they operate illegally, they actually have to forfeit their profits. President Biden is going to have to weigh in. Uh, there's, there's no uh, doubt about it right now, because what's happened is it's, become, it's come from this issue of uh, my colleague Beth Wallace here, you know, asking some questions about 10 years ago to an issue of international diplomacy. Because it's an international pipeline, uh, the presidential permit can be revoked, similar to the easement, right, for the state, but think on the national level. That's actually what's happened with, that's what's killed um, Keystone and others, is the presidential uh, permit. It's not something that's been thought about much in Line 5, because it's already, be, it's already happened at the state level. But by the way, one reason to revoke a permit, the presidential permit, is if the operators aren't following the state laws. The dynamics that have changed is there's a different administration in Washington, D.C. that you've got uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, the Department of Transportation. They're who working was, on it, right? He's been adamant about shutting down Line 5 when he in his campaign. The segue to a green energy future... We couldn't even imagine... It it isn't going to involve the pipeline, okay? Yeah. The difficulty is, is will this get reconciled? Will that line get shut down or get protected before it fails? And the likelihood of that happening is low. That sucker's gonna fail before this thing gets resolved. Exactly. We don't know how safe that thing is. We don't know how likely it is to fail. Nobody does. And that situation needs to be resolved and hopefully that will get resolved at DOT. There will be a deep dive taken into this thing. But coming from my background, which is 30 years of experience in the petrochemical industry, don't hold your breath. <laughs> Let's cut, that was great, guys. <laughs> <laughs>
stuff and they're moving, so we told them to get their shit. <laughs> <laughs>